showdown time. I... I lost! It's only a game of poker. A game I've played for a long time. And only lost twice. Who was the first? The man I killed, of course. Well... It seems I found a partner I've been looking for all along. Over a game of cards? Why, yes. Over a game of cards. That was how we first met. Seven years ago. Ooh, okay. It's been a long time since I felt like such a rookie. Got to try and relax. Ah, good morning, Mr. Enigmar. I'm sorry to have sprung this on you so suddenly. I received the files from your previous attorney only yesterday. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure I'm prepared. I understand I am asking the impossible of you. Yes, well, you haven't really told me what happened yet. All we did was play cards. And that was enough. Actually, it wasn't. Trust me. Ooh! Morning, Daddy! Ah, I'm so glad you came. You okay, Daddy? They picking on you? <laughs> I'm fine as always. This old boy is here to help me after all. That's young man to you. Good morning. That's a cute outfit you have on. Thanks! My first show's today after all. Oh, I'm sure it is. What the heck is she talking about? Oh, oh boy! Huh, me? Look what he started. Um, uh, here! What's this? I don't know! I just got it over there in the hall! They told me to give it to the old boy in the blue suit with the spiky hair! They said it was really important! What's this? A memo for you or some such? Hmm, not from the looks of it. What is this? Looks like a page from someone's diary. I'll give it a read later. Well, how do you feel about the trial today? We'll get through it, somehow. Incidentally, the prosecutor today is a new guy, I hear. Ah, an easy win then, yes? They're calling him a true thoroughbred in the history of the prosecutor's office. Of course, there is one of those every year. The switching of attorneys just before the trial. I know it is a difficult situation I put you in, but allow me to say one thing, Mr. Wright. Yes? They will not be able to pronounce me guilty today. So, do your best, but do not worry. First time a defendant's ever given me a pep speech. I'll do what I can. Ha 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 I see you do not understand. You see, it will be impossible for them to declare a verdict. Uh, impossible? Yes. Isn't that right, Trucy? Yep, you bet, Daddy. My first look at the case was only yesterday. And the information I was given was a tad bit lacking, to be honest. Still, I'll do what I can, for their sake. I believe the curtains will be lifting any time now. I am in your capable hands, Mr. Wright. My client is Shadi Enigmar, known to the world as Zach Grammary. A wildly popular magician, star of Troop Grammary. His mentor, Magnify Grammary, was a rare breed of magician. He single-handedly ushered in golden age of stage magic, until he was shot dead. And Zach Ramory is the suspect. Court is now in session for the trial of Shadi Enigmar. The defense is ready, Your Honor. Is the prosecution ready? I was just thinking. Is this what all the fuss is about? Bit of a buzzkill, really. Buzz kill? Is this some new kind of crime? One of the worst. This is the trial, yeah? Where are the sweaty palms? The pounding hearts? A Gavinous concert's got ten times the thrill this gig's got. Who were you again? Clavier. Clavier Gavin. 
I came to get the party started. Legally, yeah? Gavin? Defense Attorney Christoph Gavin's... Ah, figures my bro's more famous in this part of town. Clavier Gavin. Lead singer for the mega-hit band, The Gaviners. You're out of your league, rock boy. I know what you're thinking. You're out of your league, rock boy. True, my debut single, 13 Years Hard Time for Love, went platinum overnight. But that's just a hobby to make me compare to this, yeah? Talkative, aren't you? I like your affected Euro Rock accent, by the way. I'm just getting warmed up, Air Attorney Wright. Perhaps you would be so kind as to fill us in on the case? A tongue, baby. Time to call on the opening act. What was his name again? Ah, yes. Detective Gumshoe. Hit it! And you are? Hey, you were the one who called me up here, sir. Name's Dick Gumshoe. I'm an homicide detective down at the precinct. Detective Gumshoe. Long time no see. Hey, you! Uh-huh, me? Today's the day, pal. Today, I win and you lose. I got confidence in my testimony today, see? What, you normally lack confidence in your testimony? Air Detective, this is my stage. Come the antics. Huh? All this hey you win and such. And I could care less about your history together. Ugh. Very well, Detective Gumshoe, if you would. Please tell us about the case at hand. It happened six days back, in a room at the General Hospital. The facts are as simple as they come. Here's the crime scene. The victim was a patient, asleep in a hospital bed. The killer comes in, puts a pistol to his forehead, and bam, lights out. Them's the facts. Hmm. Not so long ago, the victim Magnifique Grammary was a famous man. He had the entire country under his magical spell, as it were. I guess, the great magician. He retired years ago, though. Say the name Magnifique to one of my generation, and be lucky to get a blank stare. Yes, though I'm sure the youngsters today know his disciples even better. I dare say Troop Grammary has made quite a name for themselves. Anyhow, the retired Magnifique's been in the hospital for the last year. Hmm, what was it? A uh, malignant tutor or something? Doing something to his liver, I think. Yeah. A malignant tumor, perhaps? In other words, he had liver cancer. He had only three months left to live, in fact. Hmm. The facts do seem simple enough. But something's not right. The victim was already climbing a three-month stairway to heaven. Why not wait for him to knock, knock, knock on heaven's door? Why shoot him? I wouldn't have put it quite so lyrically, but it's true. Why make the effort to commit murder when the victim was about to die? Incidentally, the victim had a serious case of diabetes. Diabetes? In fact, he was about to shoot up with insulin. When he was shot with a pistol, the syringe was found at the crime scene. Chronic diabetes and cancer. As much as it pains me to say it, the victim was clearly at the end of his life. Hmm. I believe the question before us is clear, then. Why did the killer have to shoot this dying man? What reason could he have had? Very well, detective. Perhaps you can enlighten us as to the circumstances of the shooting. Yes, sir. Actually, the victim kind of ordered the defendant to do him in. A few days before it happened, the victim sent a letter ordering his own murder. The defendant did what was asked of him and shot the old man in the forehead. The bullet was fired from the pistol found at the scene, no doubt about it. And a pistol definitely belonged to the old man, sir. Wha- What? You're saying the victim ordered his own shooting? Those are the facts. I have here the letter in question. Very unusual indeed. Although, could such a thing as a letter really cause one to pull a trigger, I wonder? I believe the answer to that question can be found at the end of the letter. <laughs> ah, you cannot refuse, and we both know the reason why. Detective Gumshoe, can you explain this to the court? 
Unfortunately, even the defendant won't say a peep about that bit, sir. One thing bothers me about this. Why didn't he just say 11? Why have him come at 11.05 without some specific reason? The devil is in the details, Air Attorney. Well, was there some reason? As it turns out, there was. Every night for a half hour starting at 11 o'clock, the victim, Magnifi Grammary, was given an IV. An IV. There it is in the picture, off to the side of the bed. At 11 o'clock, a doctor would come to set up the IV. 30 minutes later, he would come back for the empty bag. This happened every night without fail. So that was the only time they could meet without the chance of an untimely interruption during his IV. Very well, shall we begin? Mr. Wright, your cross-examination, if you would. What's this reason he couldn't refuse, I wonder? He could have at least mentioned it to me. How can you be so sure? Hey, you gotta learn to stop relying on people to do your thinking for you, pal. Learn to think for yourself. Get that noggin cranking. Feel the grasp the concept of questioning detective. First, we got this letter. It says shoot in the forehead loud and clear. I can see that, but I still wouldn't do it. Well, maybe you need to grow yourself a backbone, pal. You fail to grasp the concept of shooting people is bad, detective. We also found the defendant's pistol at the scene. Traces of gunpowder residue shows that had been fired recently. Well, Mr. Wright? As far as I can tell from looking at this photo, there seems to be no issue with the prosecution's claim. The photo. Maybe there's something in there I can use. So they're saying the defendant shot the victim in the forehead. I think there's a hole in the prosecution's argument. Clearly, Mr. Enigmar... Looking at this photo, another possibility occurs to me. Yes? What does the letter tell us? That the defendant had a reason he couldn't refuse his teacher's wishes. Bingo, pal. That's why the defendant popped him one in the forehead. Oh, the defense disagrees. You see, the defendant had another choice he could make. Objection! What? And you can prove that with this photo? I can prove he had a choice, yes. The defendant might have fired like he was ordered, but he didn't shoot the victim's forehead. Well, let's hear what you're thinking, Mr. Wright. If he didn't shoot the victim's forehead, what did the defendant shoot? Take that! The clown doll? Take a closer look, see? It's been shot in the forehead, too. Ah, there's a hole in his forehead. Yes, and a hole in the prosecution's claim. Objection! Ha, huh. and I suppose you have a reason as to why he'd shoot the clown doll? He didn't just shoot the doll. He shot the doll's forehead. His forehead. Ah! Let's read the orders once more, shall we? You will shoot one shot square in the forehead. Which is exactly what he did. He shot the clown doll square in the forehead. The defense has raised an intriguing possibility. That hole in the clown's forehead. It definitely looks like it was shot. Bailiff, send someone to investigate this matter. Objection! I admit I'm impressed, but I expected nothing less. Still, this doesn't mean he didn't shoot the victim. Objection! Perhaps he did have to shoot a forehead as ordered. But the letter says nothing about whose forehead. This was the only way he had to follow his orders without taking a life. Hmm. The bullet hole in the clown doll's forehead does demand an explanation. It might very well be a clue. If Prosecutor Gavin is right, it alone does not prove the defendant's innocence. You are not saying for sure the defendant didn't shoot the victim. So sorry, Mr. Wright. How sad it is to see the mighty fall. How sad it is to see the novice's overconfidence. He doesn't realize just how big this little hole is going to get. Detective Gumshoe, please take this newfound fact into account as you continue your testimony. 
So what if he shot the clown? He still shot the victim, pal. You mean this pistol, the one in the crime scene photo? That's the one. It's a funny looking gun, so there's no mistake in it. We compared the bullet taken from the victim's skull with the bullet fired from this gun. The rifling marks in the bullets were a perfect match. So, you verified the murder weapon, in other words. You bet we did. Why are you so certain? What pile of sand has your head been sucking all this time, pal? You never heard of Zack and Valance quick draw shoot him? Huh? What's that? One of the defendant's specialties. Zack and Valance stand on either side of a girl. Then, they shoot. But the bullets don't hit her. Instead, they hit everything else on stage. This was one of the pistols they used in their show. Got a great design, huh? The kids love it. Many boys and girls join the police because of that pistol I hear. You know, that would explain a lot about the police force. Troop Grammary stopped during that act a while ago. The old man held onto that pistol ever since. The court would like to see the pistol in question. You got it, sir. Here she is. Well, this truly is a blast from the past. It's a stage pistol for magic shows, see? But it can fire real bullets. Hmm. It looks so much bigger on real life than on TV. Yeah, but it can only hold one round. By the way, the pistol's firing chamber is empty. And it shows traces of having been fired recently. So, were any fingerprints found on the gun? Unfortunately, no. Of course, the defendant is known for wearing gloves. We might say that a lack of fingerprints is, in fact, a fingerprint of its own. Aha, intriguing point. Well made. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Not well made, not intriguing. In any case, the court accepts this evidence. My grandchild will get a kick out of seeing this. But now it's time to return to our testimony. Objection! The trickiest case has often seen the simplest. Prosecutor Gavin, you missed the bullet hole in the clown's forehead. If you hadn't missed that, you might have come to a very different conclusion. Understand? Yeah, but like I just said, pal, after he shot the clown in the forehead, he went and Objection! did nothing of the sort to the victim. The pistol proves he could not. The murder weapon? How? It's quite simple, Your Honor. This pistol only holds one bullet at a time. Ah. If he had shot the clown in the forehead, he couldn't have shot the victim, too. Yard! Th that's not a contradiction, not even close. All he had to do was reload the pistol after the first shot. Oh, where did he get the extra bullet? They're not so easy to come by, you know. If you claim the defendant had one ready, then prove to us how he got it. Ugh. <laughs> I had a feeling this wasn't over yet. No, this party's just getting started. And I haven't proven anything yet beyond my good looks and startling record sales. And an utter lack of humility. Mm. Ah, what's this? It seems that the prosecution has another witness prepared. Like I said, Air Detective was just the warm up act. Ah. Uh, now that the audience has gotten a taste of what's to come, they're ready. Ready for what? For my decisive witness, of course. A witness who you will find can prove one thing for us. That it was Zach Grammarly who shot the victim in the forehead. Very well. We will pause for a 15 minute recess. This might be my lucky break. I'll need that 15 minutes to talk to my client, Zach. Court is adjourned. Very impressive, Mr. Wright. I have to say, I expected nothing less. We've only just begun. 
I was hoping you could tell me a bit more about what happened, actually. I did not think you would believe me if I told you. Better that you discover the truth for yourself. I was thinking of you, you know. I think we need less thinking and more talking. That night in the hospital, what really happened? Ah, the way your eyes gleam, Mr. Wright. You'll scare Trucy. Speaking of which, where is she? You have seen the problem yourself, the letter. The one shot in the forehead one, right? Yes, and the reason he speaks of. I could not deny my mentor's wish, even if it meant my own death. Why not? This is something I will not say, for now at least. What's this for now business? I have done many things in my life, some well, some poorly. But this is a cross we must bear alone to our graves. We? You wanted to know about the night of the incident. Finally, this guy sure likes to take his time getting into the important stuff. Of course, I had no intention of shooting my mentor. I stuck into his room that night at the appointed time. And I found there upon his bedside table two pistols. Two? Yes, the one I had used on stage. And the one that had been used by my partner, Valent. Oh, for the Zack and Valent's quick draw thing. My mentor had the look of one sleeping. I stood by his bedside, hearing only the light sound of his breathing. Then I took the pistol into my hand. I cannot deny that my resolve faltered then for a moment. You faltered? You mean you thought about shooting him? Recall there was a reason I could not refuse his request. His last such request, though not his first. So, there were other requests you couldn't refuse before. To be honest, I've not always been steadfast, and I fear I've bought praying for Pontrusi. Is Magnifi coercing his disciples somehow? Because what was going on in Troop Grammary? Yet, in the end, I did not shoot him. Instead, I turned and shot the clown. I took the pistol I had fired and placed it in my pocket. In your pocket? I believe if you examine the bullet in the clown's head, you will find it to be different than the one in my mentor. The, what were those called? Rifling marks. Yes, well, that is all I have to tell you concerning the case. Concerning the case? You mean there is something else you can tell me? Heh, ha ha ha. You are a fascinating man, Mr. Wright. Thanks? Yes, there is something. My mentor, his eyes opened. What? Magnifi Grammary? The old devil. He was not asleep, you see. Of course, the gunshot would have woken him anyway. And there we had our last discussion as mentor and pupil. It was not a long discussion. Maybe five, ten minutes or so. What did you talk about? Ha ha! Mr. Wright, did I not just tell you? It does not concern this case. Zach Grammary. Seems pretty steadfast to me, or maybe just stubborn. Mr. Wright, your presence is requested in the courtroom. Once again, I am in your hands. Right, let's get back in there. Court is now back in session. During our recess, a blue was found in dug up from the clown's head. Well, wow, this is news. And the rifling marks? There wasn't time to do a detailed analysis. Though, they did find the weapon type matches the murder weapon. Hmm. Well, that's not very conclusive, is it? Which is why I'm about to call my very decisive witness. Your decisive witness? How many times have I ever heard those words? Though, they often turn out to be far less decisive than you think. Oh, don't worry on my account. I'm quite confident this witness will do the job. After all, he is intimately acquainted with the players in our little production. Being the other half of two Grammarie's famous duo, Zack and Valent. Valent Grammarie. So we get to meet the great Magnifi's other disciple. Perhaps we'll start by asking your name and occupation. Valent Grammarie! Magician! Er, uh, and you're the decisive witness, are you? You can prove your fellow student your partner's guilt. Fate! The grand illusion! Filled with traps and tricks! Well, wait. The shooting took place in the hospital after 11 o'clock at night. If you're a witness, does that mean you were there that late? If one were to deduce this logically, the conclusion is... Yes! Um, okay. I always get the characters, don't I? I have an interesting fact for you. You see, several days before the crime... 
My witness received this. That looks very familiar. Wait. That's the same letter Zach Grammary received. Yes, or perhaps I should say, ta-da! Order, order, order. And what does it say? Surely not the same thing. Perhaps you should see for yourself. Why, it's practically the same. The court accepts this to do evidence. This is most unusual. Exactly what was going on with you folks. What exactly was your troop grammary up to? By which you mean? I'm just giving trouble envisioning a man who would ask his students to kill him. Both of them, no less. It's just my opinion, Ed Dutch. But from these letters, I'd say he was coercing them, not asking them. We walked the magician's path together, and in so doing, shared much of our lives. When people are so close, there is strain. A warping of relations, you might say. Yet this has nothing to do with the case at hand. By which you mean you're not going to tell us. Which makes me wonder even more about this reason they couldn't refuse. Well, let's get on with the testimony for starters. The defendants, Zach Ramry, stands accused. Tell us why. Oh, I'll do more than that. For where he walks, the red roses rise, singing hymns to the miracle that is magic! Fascinating. Though I hardly need to remind you that the evidence could just as clearly point to you as a suspect. The letter, the murder weapon, and now the two bullets found at the scene. In fact, the only difference seems to be the designated time. Ha 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 ha! As every magician knows, timing is everything. Yes. And now it's time to get this party fired up. That night, I visited the hospital room at the time Magnafia requested. The smell of gunpowder hung in the room, and my mentor had taken his final bow. I did not imagine my fellow student might have received the same instructions. Yet a deal with the deed is still a deal. Death's sweet kiss I gave to the clown. Then I informed the doctor and the police. Hmm. So you were the one who reported the crime. Indeed. I would think this fact alone would clear my name of suspicion. Let's not jump to any conclusions. Yes, the cross-examination generally comes before the conclusions in this court. But if your testimony proves to be true, then the defendant, Zach Ramory, is guilty. And if it wasn't Zach Ramory, then the killer was you, Valent. And no disappearing act will get you out of that. Two bullet holes at the scene. One of the victim and one of the clown. You're saying that the one who shot the clown was you? No doubt my partner Zach has said much the same thing. Yeah, because whoever didn't shoot the clown committed murder. I better dig around here a bit more and see what I turn up. Mr. Valen, let me ask you about something else concerning the crime scene. Namely... How many pistols were there when you entered the room? By which you mean what, precisely? Two pistols were used in the Zack and Valent quick draw shoot him, correct? One for each of you. You are well informed, yet only one of my old friends sat in the hospital room that night. What did Zack tell me back in the lobby? Of course, I had no intention of shooting my mentor. I snuck into his room that night at the appointed time, and found there upon his bedside table two pistols. I took the pistol I had fired and placed it in my pocket. I see no problem with that statement. Only one pistol is visible in the photograph of the crime scene, after all. So you picked up that pistol and fired it. Indeed I did. Alakazam, Alakazing, Alkaboom. Hmm. Is the number of pistols really so important? The number of pistols is quite important, Your Honor. Very well. Please add this detail to your testimony. What can I do but obey? Only one pistol was in the hospital room that night. With it, I shot the clown. Objection! 
According to the defendant, Zach Ramery, when he entered the room, there were two pistols on that table. Two? One of those pistols he used to shoot the clown in the forehead. Then he left with it in his pocket. Of course, this is what he would say. Unlike the hapless clown, we must assume our defendant has some brains in his head. Well, what about what Sir, Mr. Valen has told us? You see, there's something about his testimony that doesn't make sense. What might that be? I told you, I took the pistol that was there and shot the clown. That's your story, at least. But the rifling marks tell a very different story, Mr. Valent. Recall what Prosecutor Gavin told us. We compared the bullet taken from the victim's skull with the bullet fired from his gun. The rifling marks in the bullets were a perfect match. Ah! Mr. Valent, if you fired this pistol, then you shot the victim in the forehead! Order, order, order! Well, this is all rather sudden. Objection! <laughs> what have I done? The prosecutor Gavin. I owe the court an apology. Sorry. So sorry for what? You see, I was unaware that two of these unique pistols were crafted. The analysis of the rifle march only proved the type of gun that fired them. Objection! But, but that's not what you told us before. You said you'd verified the murder weapon. Which is why I'm apologizing to you now. Quite sincerely, I'm my dad. Would you hold me accountable for a mistake made in my youth? That was just this morning. I am still young. And I'm my dad. It wasn't really my fault. If the defendant had only admitted to took one pistol from the scene of the crime, we would not be having this present discussion now. Hmm. Valent Grammary? Yes, Your Honor! You were presented to this court as a decisive witness, but you've proven to be more divisive than decisive. Objection! You'll see in time. The testimony so far has merely been a review of the facts. The proof comes next. Care to elaborate, Prosecutor Gavin? When Mr. Valent entered the hospital room, the victim had already been shot. As his next testimony will prove, and right, the real fight is about to begin. Bring it. Very well. The witness will now testify to the court. Help us determine who shot what. I arrive in the hospital room at the appointed time, which is to say 11.20 p.m. After discovering the body, I fulfilled my obligation and called in the doctor. The doctor examined the body before the police arrived. He was quite clear about the time of death, 11.10 p.m., and the one in the room at the time was my partner, not me. Hmm. Those times are rather close, you have to admit. You're talking about an alibi established over a matter of minutes. To use its end discrepancy as the basis of your alibi is easy to explain in this situation, F. Judge. For example, take our debut hit single, 13 Years Hard Time for Love. Cue to the song, press the play button, and it will play for 2 minutes 15 seconds. Do it a hundred times, the result is the same. The debut symbol is only 2 minutes and 15 seconds long? What a ripoff! Magic is the world of utmost precision. Hocus Pocus requires admirable focus. And in the time of death determined by the docker, there is an incontrovertible truth. Very well. The prosecution warned us that we're dealing with rather precise times. And we can expect the cross-examination require the same level of precision. I would hope the defense refrains from its customarily broad, sweeping accusations. Let's be blurred with the focus this case so clearly demands. Point taken. Baseless remarks will result in a penalty. Carry on, Mr. Wright. Carry on, Wright. I arrive in the hospital room at the appointed time, which is to say 11.20 p.m. After discovering the body, I fulfilled my obligation and called in the doctor. The doctor examined the body before the police arrived. He was quite clear about the time of death, 11.10 p.m. I don't think I'm stepping out on a limb to say I have some doubts about this. How could the doctor be so precise with the time? We do usually only get an estimated time of death, true. I'm not sure I've heard of a verified time of death. Magic revels in making the complex appear simple, but reality is the opposite. What appears complex in this case is a simple matter of subtraction. I see another person has done their arithmetic homework. 
The point here is the IV the victim was taking. It's quite visible in the photograph of the scene. Recall what we heard earlier about the victim, Magnifique Ramery's schedule. Every night at 11 p.m., Magnifique took an eye drop for 30 minutes. I see the IV bag right there, yes. Now, look a little closer. Follow the tube down from the bag to the end. Ah, the needle's been removed. That would see it fell out when he was shot. That would seem to be the case. When the needle comes out, the IV no longer thrips. Ah, you could just measure the remaining IV liquid. Precisely. The IV liquid functions for our purposes as an hourglass of sorts. This is how the doctor determined the time of death. From the amount remaining in the bag, it was determined that the IV had stopped ten minutes after administration began. And so it was, when I, Valance, entered that room. Ten minutes had passed since that horrible crime was committed. And this is proof. Hmm. Well, Mr. Wright? Hmm. Does that seem important? Well, seeing how it is the biggest clue we have to the time of death, I'd say it's very important. Hmm. Agreed. It would be hard to imagine a more precise way to determine the time. Behold the power of arithmetic. Very well. The witness will add this detail to his testimony. Sometimes the most magical thing of all is the truth. The water of life springs not eternal. The remaining IV liquid proves my innocence. Did you notice the IV yourself by any chance? When first I entered that room, the sense of gunpowder assailed me. Next, the mark of death upon my mentor's forehead. And then his left arm did I spy, a rose drooping and wilted. It's thorn, the discarded IV needle. Knocked from the vein by the force of the shot. Luckily for you. If that IV had not been there, why, you might be a suspect. Indubitably so. I might say it's thanks to that lucky color. Your lucky color? Indeed. Even today I wear it proudly upon my suspect self. For it always without fail brings me luck. Why, when Zack and Valent won their first Magician's Grand Prix? Yes, the very one held by the Association of International Magicians. I was adorned in this attire then, too, in our trophy of bust. Ah, what a day that was! Uh, this is one trip down memory lane no one needs. My lucky color, yes indeed, and that I be too. I say I think twas cute, especially for me, Valent. Hmm, that does seem to be the case indeed. Well, Mr. Wright, any thoughts on this testimony? Valance sure looks happy with himself. Okay, how about this lucky color testimony? I certainly sounds like your lucky colors brought you plenty of luck. But not this time. Mr. Valant, your lucky colors betrayed you. I'm afraid you've lost me. Your Honor, the witness's testimony just now clearly contradicts the evidence. What? Please recall my warning at the beginning of this cross-examination, Mr. Wright. Baseless accusations will be duly penalized. I do hope this latest accusation is well-based. Don't worry, I've got all your bases right here. Very well, let's hear the defense's claim. Where is your evidence that contradicts what Mr. Valen has told us? Take that! The crime scene tells all, Your Honor. The photo of the crime scene? All this talk of color has me yearning for black and white, clear-cut simplicity. Tell us, right. just where is this contradiction in this photo? My pleasure. And, I assure you, it's quite simple. But I can't promise anything in black and white. Let's hear what Mr. Wright has to say. What in this photo contradicts the witness's testimony? Valent Grammarie, let's get one thing straight about your lucky color. It's yellow, yes? Kind of takes the mystery out of it, but yes. Something wrong with yellow, Mr. Wright? Yes, there is. Decisively wrong, in fact. Take another look at the photo of the crime scene. Well, watch this. Confusion, doubt, tell us what do you elderly eyes spy? Even my elderly eyes can see a problem here, Mr. Valent. Look at that IV bag. Uh, what is this? What? Foul m chick <sighs> It would be hard to call the IV liquid yellow. 
and I'm afraid no magic was involved in the taking of this photograph. Ah, uh, Allah, Allah is, Allah is oh! Order, order, order! What does this mean? Objection! This, this is some kind of mistake. Yes, Prosecutor Gavin. Your witness is a mistake. The greener they are, the harder they fall. I suppose there's no substitute for experience. Violent Grammary, as you reminded us several times, your lucky color is yellow, but the IV is clearly not. Wha well This contradiction can mean only one thing. Objection! And to think, you almost had me. I see your true colors now, Ace Attorney Phoenix Wright. Something you'd like to tell us, Prosecutor Gavin? As far as this court can tell, the witness's testimony does contradict the evidence. <laughs> ah, yes, a contradiction. One that I shall be pleased to hand right back to Mr. Wright. How do you mean? How? Because the witness has made no mistakes. Yeah, I agree. At a glance, the ivy liquid does appear sort of greenish-yellow. But I assure you, the liquid itself is quite yellow. Yellow liquid? How can you say that? As far as I can tell from this photo, it's green. Yes, but what color is the IV bag itself? The bag? You mean the plastic bag on the hook? Hmm, it looks like a, I want to say light blue. Precisely. Figured it out yet? Put a yellow liquid in a blue bag and... You get green. This, incidentally, is liquid true color. I see. Your explanation does have the ring of truth to it. As I thought. There's no substitute for experience, Prosecutor Gavin. What? You may tell a good tale, but you've just proven something rather grave. For you, that is. G grave The liquid in the IV is yellow, yes. But how did this witness know that? It's quite unnatural when you think about it. You did think about it, didn't you? <coughs> ah, Ugh. Your Honor, the defense requests an explanation from the witness. At the scene of the crime, the IV liquid appears to be green. <coughs> so let me ask, how did the witness know the IV liquid was actually yellow? Alakaz- OH MY GOD! Order, order, order! Mr. Wright, you will explain this at once. The witness clearly knew the color of the IV liquid. So I'm sure it means something, but what? I can think of only one possibility, Your Honor. The witness, Valent Grammary, has testified that the IV liquid is yellow because... From the facts before us, the answer is clear. The witness knew that the IV liquid was yellow. Why? Because he'd seen it before. But not inside the blue bag we see in the photo. He saw the liquid by itself in a clear colorless bag. I suppose she would have had to, but I'm still not clear as to what all this means. Ask yourself, why would he know if he didn't work at a hospital? That's where you'll find your meaning, Your Honor. Objection! I'm afraid I find nothing. So what if you knew the IV liquid's color? Leave the getting excited over absolutely nothing to our teeny bopper fans, yeah? Objection! The IV liquid is the only evidence proving the time of death. A 30-minute hourglass with 20 minutes worth of sand remaining. Your claim, Prosecutor Gavin. I remember it well. However, there's a critical difference between an hourglass and an IV bag. Well, wait, I know. An hourglass is just sand, but an IV bag is just liquid. I'm right, right? As much as it pains me to say this, Your Honor, no. Unlike the sands through an hourglass, IV liquid enters the patient's body, at which point, like magic, it disappears. However, what if the amount of eye liquid had increased? You couldn't tell, could you? After all, there's no way of knowing how much went in. Objection! Let me get this straight. All right. You're saying the witness watered down the victim's IV bag? Not with water, but with IV liquid. That's how you knew the IV liquid was yellow. Now wait, wait, I said wait! 
How am I an amateur sister myself, a say to perform such a task? Objection! I'm an amateur too, but I can pour water into a cup. Objection! I'm afraid there's quite a big difference between a cup and an IV bag. Quite. Can you prove our witness is capable of such a feat? Hmm, he has a point, amateurs. I, at least, would have some difficulty pouring IV liquid into that bag. You don't need to be an expert to see the look on the witness's face. He added liquid to that IV to throw off the time of death. I tired of these fairy tales lacking evidence. Well, Mr. Wright, any solid evidence to bring us back down to Earth? Valent Grammary, I'm afraid your magic won't serve you well in a life of crime. Might I ask what you're strongly suggesting? Magic relies on props, and props become evidence. Our witness was certainly able to increase the amount of IV liquid in the bag. All he had to do was work a little magic, and the prop was... The victim's syringe. It's the perfect prop for the magically increasing IV trick, and easy enough for an amateur to use. What? What kind of evidence is that? The syringe was clean, not a trace of liquid in it. Objection! And don't you find that odd, Prosecutor Gavin? What? The victim had the syringe to administer his insulin shots. There should have been traces of insulin left inside. Well, Val Cramery, as you pointed out yourself, the IV liquid makes the perfect clock. One that you could manipulate at will. Alec. Alakazar! I do believe, well, with this being his first, that the burden of this trial has been a bit too much to hear for Prosecutor Gavin. I'm afraid that, while there is a doubt as to the amount of I liquid in that bag, the time of death cannot be proven. And that brings our trial to a close for today. Well, maybe I can squeeze an extra day out of this. We can do a little much needed investigation work. I see there are no objections. Objection! Is it? <laughs> Truly, there's no substitute for experience. Nothing blinds one to the truth so effectively. A word to the wise. Underestimate the young and they'll sweep their feet out from under you. In the way you never, ever expected. You see, I know exactly what you're thinking. What's he talking about? You say the witness used the starins to manipulate the level of the IV liquid. But there is no proof. There's no proof you didn't do it either. Yes, quite true. Huh? He's admitting it? Nor was this witness quite as decisive as I'd hoped. This I admit, after all, I linger in the past and the future holds so much. You have something in mind, Prosecutor Gavin? Proof, Air Judge. I have another way to prove my case. With evidence, no less. What's this? This is the victim Magnifi Gramni's diary. Diary? After going into the hospital, Magnifi began writing his memoirs, it seems. The story of his birth, his startling debut, and the meeting of his disciples. It seems he intended for the last of that end quite appropriately with his death. Wait, that book doesn't say what the reason was, does it? The reason why his disciples couldn't refuse his last request? Sadly, it does not. What's important here is on the last page. Apparently, the victim wrote in his journal that night. Even after the idea had begun at 11 o'clock p.m. Let's read, shall we? Hmm. This does appear to have been written just before his death. The court accepts this new evidence. Read the very last part with particular care. This journal may end here, or it may go on, but not long. That depends on his hand. Of course, by his. He refers to our defendant, Zach Remini. That would make sense, yes. He was the first scheduled visitor, after all. But look at what he said before that. This journal may end here, or it may go on. It may go on! Magnus Remini intended to write again. 
That is, is that Karamari didn't pull the trigger. I see the defense understands the meaning of this. The victim's battery does not go on, it ends. Because Manavi's life was brought to an end by the defendant, Zach Ramani. Or, 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 cross your cabin. Are you certain that Manavi Grammary wrote this? There is no mistaking his handwriting. Well, this does seem to be significant. According to this, Manavi did intend to continue his diary. Yet, if this diary ended here, which plainly it did, then the one who pulled the trigger was the first visitor, Zach Ramani. Well, how do you like me now, eh, right? Still too green for your tastes, hmm? He's right about the diary being pretty clear. Still, I find it hard to believe that he'd overlook such an obvious problem with his previous evidence. Well, Mr. Wright, the witness's testimony we heard was lacking. But put together with this evidence, it seems quite efficient for a case. The diary is accepted like this. The trial's over. Maybe it's time for me to show them something. I'm left with no choice but to show my own evidence. What? You have some evidence that overturns this diary? Hmm. It's not too late to rethink this and avoid more embarrassment. Very well. Please show us your evidence, Mr. Wright. Incidentally, don't even think of showing us this diary I've just shown the court. Now that we've come this far, I hope you have something a little more decisive. Show us evidence that proves the victim continued writing his diary. Alright, I'd be happy to. The decisive evidence proving that the diary didn't end with this page is... Take that! First, take a close look at this diary. Note that a page has clearly been ripped out. Watch this. I hadn't noticed that at all. That's why we're still here talking about this. And it just so happens, I have here what I believe to be the missing page. Alika, I don't believe it! Looking at this page, it's hard to imagine that the first visitor that night shot Mac and the Grammary. That's the defense's position. Wait, let me see that. What, Sam Hell? Why, this is the continuation of the victim's diary. Note the torn edge of the page. It's a perfect match with the torn remains of the last page of Magnethy's diary. Quite remarkable. Would you care to explain what all this means, Error Attorney? The diary continued after his first visitor came, which means that the victim was still alive after Zach Grammary left, leaving no one to take his life but the second visitor. Valent Grammary. No! No! The handwriting, too, matches that on the other pages. This is, without a doubt, the genuine article. Order, order, order. But, but wait, this is, that's impossible. That old man couldn't have written that. Objection! Finally, you just couldn't resist, could you, Er right? Resist what, presenting solid evidence? Er judge. Yes, Prosecutor Gavin. Might I request we put the current cross-examination on hold? The prosecution would like to call a new witness. But, but Prosecutor Gavin, this evidence overturns the current witnesses. I ask only to put it on hold. Please, my new witness has a very, very important piece of testimony to give. Five minutes, no more. I promise, Your Honor. Well, if you put it that way, Mr. Wright, what's your take on this? Well, Your Honor, Judging from this enthusiasm, we'll have to hear this new testimony sooner or later anyway. So it might as well be sooner. Then, though this is highly, highly irregular, we will put the current cross-examination on hold. The witness may step down. 
Now, Prosecutor Gavin, please bring the surprise witness to the courtroom. I had a bad feeling just then. That ripped out page was too obvious. He must have known. And I should have known it was a bad sign all around. Hmm. Holding trials, no audience is a first, even for me, Prosecutor Gavin. I beg the court's understanding. But I had to make a judiciary deal with the witness to secure his testimony. A judiciary deal? The details of his testimony may have some legal ramifications, shall we say. I thought it best to contain the information to this room. Hmm, very well. And you are the witness, I gather? Ah, uh, yes. Yes, sir. State the name and occupation for the record. Er, um, my name is Drew Misham. I'm a painter. A painter? And you are somehow related to this case? No, well, not per se. I have one simple question for this witness. Mr. Misham, was it? Do you know what this is? Oh, yeah, I know it well. How's that possible? Have you seen this diary page somewhere before? Oh, yeah, I mean, I made it. You what? You made it? Yes, you might call it one of my works. The prosecutor's office received a tip-off yesterday. Illegal evidence has been prepared for the trial of Zach Grammerly. Illegal evidence? I initiated an investigation and found this witness. A painter to the world at large, through mission is another side, you might say. He is skilled in making perfect reproductions of certain things. Forgeries, in other words. The forgeries? Well, so, we are to understand that this page here is... A fake. Prepared by a certain defense attorney. Objection! Hold it! I didn't prepare this evidence. Objection! Ah, the attorney speaks. Something about this page, I presume. But what is he saying? It makes no sense. After all, it was you who presented this evidence to us, Phoenix, right? Witness. Er, Mr. Misham, was it? Who requested this forgery? Who was your client? The... Uh, I don't know. What? Most of my clients prefer to remain anonymous, even to me. I don't think the items they want to receive my payment. That's the extent of my contact with them. Objection! But there's no proof this is a fake. It's a fake. Huh? To avoid just this sort of problem, I always put a special mark on my works. I can say without a doubt, this is mine. Mr. Wright, you have just presented illegal evidence to this court. My court. It was careless of me. That's all I can say. Oh, oh boy. Um, uh, here. What's this? I don't know. I just got it over there in the hall. They told me to give it to the old boy in the blue suit with the spiky hair. They said it was really important. It was all a trap, a fatal trap. Mr. Wright. Yes. Do you have an explanation for yourself? If I did, would the court hear it? Probably not. Forging evidence is a serious crime, and presenting it in court, a serious mistake. A fatal mistake for an attorney. Fatal too, perhaps. For your client, I fear. Tell me, what kind of defense relies on forged evidence? The answer is quite clear. A guilty one! Objection! Your Honor, wait! I understand that presenting forged evidence in court is a serious crime, but you cannot hold my client responsible for actions I undertook as an individual. I am sorry, Mr. Wright. Your Honor? Another close call, I dare say. If the prosecutor's office hadn't received that hot tip, 
everything would have gone the way you wanted it to, yeah? I even gave you a chance. Too bad you decided not to think before embarrassing yourself. I see no need for further discussion on this matter. Special witness dismissed. Mr. Attorney. Yes? Could I ask your name? Phoenix Wright. Mr. Wright. I have seen and studied many people, but none like you. I'll remember you, Mr. Wright. Though I deeply regret having to declare a verdict in this way. This trial is over. You have the right to find a new attorney and make an appeal. However, this court must... Ah, your honor. Yes, Mr. Zack? There is one thing I wish to make clear. Today, in this courtroom, you cannot declare me guilty. It is impossible. I'm afraid the defendant is quite mistaken. I most certainly have the authority to declare a verdict on you. Except, tell me, how do you plan on announcing your verdict? When your defendant does not exist. Does it exist? What are you talking about? I am talking about this! M Mr. Enigmar! The defendant escaped! Find him, quick! Bailiff, close all edges from the building! On the double, he must not be allowed to escape! That day, in that courtroom, a miracle occurred. The defendant, Shadi Enigmar, a.k.a. Zach Grammery, did not just escape from court. He literally, unbelievably, vanished. Right before the bailiff's eyes. No one ever saw him again, not since that day. This is the Grammery miracle. <laughs> no verdict was declared. After all, the defendant didn't exist. That's how it happened. The trial of Magician Zach Grammery vanished along with him for all eternity. The mysteries that remained behind were all solved, however. But not until seven years later.